At the helm of managing unprecedented dual emergencies is the state's point person for disaster planning and logistics, the director of Florida's emergency management uh, division. And that person is Jared Moskowitz, who splits his life between Tallahassee and Parkland. And he joins us now right there via Skype. Jared, so grateful for your time with us this morning. And I want to begin by asking you just a kind of a human being question. What is it like to be you in that position at this moment? Uh, well, you'll have to read that in my uh, upcoming uh, book. Uh, <laughs> no, all, all, all joking aside, I mean, listen, uh, you know, I, when I took this job, obviously, no one was talking about a pandemic, let alone a pandemic uh, in, into hurricane season. I mean, at, at the end of the day, unfortunately, I went through the, the Parkland experience in, in my hometown, which was, you know, a disaster uh, in itself. Uh, you know, that really helped prepare me uh, mentally for what we're dealing with now uh, with, with COVID-19. And so uh, let alone now getting into hurricane season. So, look, I'm I'm doing OK. Obviously, uh, I, I try to stay away from testing my blood pressure on an everyday level because I, I probably don't want to see what the numbers show. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're doing okay. This is what we all signed up for. Uh, I got the uh, most qualified staff uh, in the country doing, you know, you know, Hurricane Hermine, Matthew, Irma, Wilma, and almost Dorian last year. So, you know, we're pros. Yeah. Jared, I think your book might be called The Room Where It Really Happened or <laughs> The State Where It Really Happened. Happens a lot. Uh, I think that everyone would agree South Florida pretty much dodged the bullet on this one. But this storm, as you are more aware than we are, is now raking up the coast, the east coast of the state of Florida. Give us a status report. Where do things stand for you? Yeah, so, sure. So, you know, this storm has been a little bipolar. I'm a hurricane. I'm a tropical storm. I'm a hurricane. I'm a tropical storm. Uh, but look, this was, in my opinion, a really good test of a lot of the new protocols and procedures that have been put in place uh, here in the state of Florida uh, to uh, battle hurricane season uh, with COVID-19. Uh, Non-congregate sheltering specifically, you know, these are, this is something new uh, that uh, Florida helped uh, bring to the forefront with our partners at FEMA uh, who agreed to make it a reimbursable ex expense. So these are hotels that we've brought on that can be used uh, for sheltering so that people can have social distancing. People who might have COVID-19 or fail a temperature screening get diverted uh, to, to that hotel. So that was a really good test of that system. Right now we've had, you know, 50 requests uh, from our counties uh, for uh, all sorts of different equipment. Uh, and 100% of those missions were fulfilled uh, uh, before uh, any impacts have been felt. And so right now, you know, we're watching it as we move up the coast. Uh, I think 20,000 people uh, were uh, have, are at without power uh, globally right now. That's getting restored really quickly on a, on a rolling basis. The ground is saturated, so it's possible we could see some trees come down, which is some picking up of the wind. Uh, so we could see more power outages. Some shelters have been opened for, you know, special needs, pet shelters, so that people have options. Uh, Palm Beach County did a, a vac voluntary evacuation in Zone A dealing with uh, mobile homes and unsafe structures. But, you know, right now, it uh, looks like we're in really good shape, but we're not declaring mission accomplished. Uh, until this thing is away from us. Yeah, and you know, here in Miami-Dade and Broward and Monroe counties, we're we're now just focused on some crummy weather and back to really zeroing in on staying safe and healthy from COVID. One of the most significant actions I think this weekend was the closure of all the testing sites because of what the potential weather might have been. So I wonder if you would weigh in on the, the problem that that's going to cause as far as the numbers of testing and especially since results have been in such a lag. I mean, what is the impact of those closures on us tracking COVID now? Yeah, so look, we have to plan for the worst, hope for the best. And so thankfully, we, we, we wound up with the best case scenario, but we had to close those sites because obviously, you know, we have infrastructure down there that can't withstand uh, tropical storm force winds. And obviously, I can't put people who are working at those sites, nurses uh, and folks wanting to come get tested and other personnel in, in harm's way. So that was the right decision. Obviously, there'll be some indirect impacts uh, on testing. Uh, you know, we, we think the sites will only be down for, for three, three and a half days. So we think they're going to be mostly minimal. Uh, you still could go get tested uh, at a lot of hospitals uh, that we're doing testing or private uh, testing that's been going on. You know, we really have changed how we're doing testing here in the state of Florida, especially over the last couple of weeks. We've gone to what's called observed self-swabbing, where you swab yourself, because uh, we're finding that we're able to get those results uh, in about 72 hours, which really allows contact tracing to pick up. So we've diverted away from a lot of these natural 
national laboratories that were having a national issue with reagent and their capacity to complete all these tests for all these states. Obviously, that was unacceptable. Uh, you can't you can't wait seven days for a test and expect to do uh, contact tracing. If Amazon can get you a package in a day or two, we should be able to get results uh, in the same time. So that's what we're really focused on here in the state of Florida. We seem to be stabilizing. Uh, that uh, you know that gives us you know some sigh of relief. But let's be clear, you know we still have a lot of people in hospitals. We still have a lot of families that are dealing with COVID. Families that have lost loved ones. Families that can't visit loved ones in the hospitals. So, you know this this is still affecting us. Still affecting us in a very large way. Uh, everyone needs to continue to do you know their mitigation efforts. You know wear masks uh, at all times when you're out in public places. Stay home if you can telework if you can, social distance, uh, you know, this stuff seems to be working. So we got to keep at it, even though we all have disaster fatigue. Yeah. Uh, Jared, if I may, let's go back to this issue, the challenge of providing shelter in a pandemic. You mentioned non-congregate uh, sheltering. You mentioned the fact that you had some hotels available. But I understand, explain, one of your new policies was if people were going to go be put into a school, that they were going to be put into classrooms, not just everybody into the auditorium. Is that right? Yeah. So what we said is, look, we want people to have a plan. So, you know, if you believe that you live in an unsafe structure or you live in an evacuation zone or surge zone prone to flooding and you need to leave, especially, you know, in a smaller storm like this, uh, we, we want you to have options. So, you know, if you can go to a friend's house, you can go to a family member's house, you know, that's great. If you can get into a non congregate shelter like a hotel, that's also really good. But if you're going to go to a regular shelter, we work with FEMA, the CDC, and the Red Cross uh, on developing protocol, 80 pages of policies that we sent down to the county emergency managers to limit shelters to about 50 people uh, per shelter, social distancing, temperature checks. We provided thermometers. We made sure that PPE was readily available. We sent down PPE kits for everybody that had gloves, hand sanitizer, and masks uh, available. But what we said to the counties is work with your school boards rather than putting people in auditoriums or cafeterias. Maybe you can separate people by classrooms. So those decisions are made at the county level because counties do sheltering and evacuations. But that was part of our recommendation. You know, I want to go back to something you just mentioned kind of blithely. We are stabilizing, you said, uh, too soon to really make a prognostication. But I just want to mention, since we get the new numbers right before we come on the air, that it looks like the, the trend line percentage-wise, state of Florida trending 13% positive, Miami-Dade 19, so under 20, which is actually a positive number at this point, relatively speaking, and Broward at 14% positive. Of course, in context, those numbers sort of are a snapshot of what's happened in the past week, 10 days or two weeks. Give us your sort of expert opinion on that trend line. Go, go into that, if you would, a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, first of all, let me be clear. We have a long way to go. Uh, you know, we, we are we are nowhere uh, out of the woods uh, at the moment, but the, the trends are looking looking better. You know, those are the positivity rates uh, with retesting people who are positive. If you look at the positivity rates for new cases, uh, we're under 10% today uh, statewide, uh, and we have under 8,000 cases for the first time uh, in a long period of time, new cases, not retests. Yeah. So that's good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. But, but I want to be clear. We, we have a long way to go. This is, this is, gonna, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, you know, it looks like we've plateaued and we're coming down. How fast we come down versus uh, f flatlining is very important for those hospitalizations so that our, our medical system can obviously weather the storm. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, you know, I, people need to continue to do mitigation efforts. We need to continue to keep up, you know, stay uh, home if you can. You know, if you have to go out, please wear a mask. They work. If you have to go eat at a restaurant, you have to go out and do those things. Please wear a mask. If you can not do those things, telework, stay home, uh, you know, because these things are working. It's why the trend line is going downwards. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Jared Moskowitz, the director of the Division of Emergency Management. We're glad you're on the job. Democrat in a Republican administration. Nice bit of bipartisanship. We appreciate that. And grateful for your time at this moment. Thanks, Jared.